again, and we are back on S40, and Riva is here to talk to us about our child care centers and this building that we live. So, Riva, can you? Good morning. Um, Riva Murphy, Deputy Commissioner for Child Development at the Department for Children and Families. Uh, thanks for inviting me to testify in Senate Bill 40 related to testing and remediation of lead in the drinking water of schools and child care programs. We agree that the, investigate, that the ingestion of lead has a negative impact on the healthy development of children. Younger children with a small body mass and in a critical and rapidly evolving developmental phase are particularly vulnerable to these negative impacts. CDD staff, however, are not experts in the science of food safety and we look to our colleagues at Department of Health for guidance on what is reasonably safe for children and how we ensure that what children eat and drink in childcare and early learning programs is safe for their developing bodies and brains. For that reason, CDD has long required testing for lead in drinking water of regulated child care programs. Crystal Micho, uh, CCD, CDD Director of Licensing and I can answer any technical questions you may have about the current regulations, enforcement, and remediation. Um, we also have copies of the regulations and uh, guidance bookmarked to current regulations, so if you wanted to read the full regulations, you can go to that website, and you'll see when I get to the bottom. I actually put in uh, the information from our guidance manuals because I was a little more clear and succinct. Um, our current regulations were developed in collaboration with VDH and the Agency of Natural Resources in 2014 and 15, accessing information and standards that were available at that time. Uh, the action level currently established for child care and early learning programs is 15 parts per billion, consistent with the US EPA's lead and copper rule. Lead negatively impacts the development of young children. So logically, the less lead the children ingest, the better. If this level isn't safe, we're happy to change it. According to February 2019 data from Department of Health related to family child care homes, if the action level of five parts per billion becomes the new standard, less than 2.8%, uh, which is 14 of the 486 family child care homes, would not be in compliance with this standard and would need to remediate in some way. Uh, VDA, the health staff estimates that it would be a few hundred dollars to purchase a treatment system with annual operating costs between 20 and $150. You'll see the data further down. That said, the current child care relations only test the first draw. And the bill as written, the new uh, testing would be the first draw and flush sample, which better represents the pipes in the home and is therefore more protective of safety. All 486 homes would have to test again to collect and submit the flush sample. Sorry. Which, uh, when we put in the new regs, we did pay for all the water testing in family child care homes. They had not been tested prior to the new regulations in uh, 2016. So we did, um, with the help of Department of Health, we paid for all the original water testing samples. And we are talking about doing that again. Um, but we just have to get it all done. Um, currently, when any unsafe levels of toxin are directed in drinking water in child care and early learning programs, we require the programs to use bottled water, which conform to the standard of five parts per billion. Therefore, we would support the five parts per billion because that could continue to be our remediation strategy that would allow them to stay open and still have sufficient water to feed the children and prepare food. Um, so the protocols for testing for environmental toxins in schools and child care and early learning programs have been very different. That is one of the reasons we believe that all early childhood programs be held to the higher standards in child care regulations. That said, child safety is always our greatest concern. We are more than willing to adapt our standards and protocols to whatever new standards are passed in the law. Um, it may take some additional resources to support child care and early learning programs through the change for the testing and um, also potentially for any remediation we would find. But we'll continue to work with our colleagues at Health and ANR to establish safe standards and protocols and continue to protect children. And then what you can see towards the bottom of this is um, these were the results from the 486 home-based providers. Uh, David has just checked, and we can try and we can try to get results for the centers as well. Um, and what our rules do say is that um, it, that any faucet where children would be drinking or where food would be prepared has to be tested. That is not every faucet in the facility, um, because we have another rule that says where children wash their hands after going to the bathroom, going to the bathroom can't be used for drinking or for food. 
Um, but we can con we can check those too, just to be perfectly safe. We just haven't in the past because we have a regulation that says they're not allowed to be used for that. Um, I'm sorry, maybe you said that um, the current requirements in stand in, in testing is any faucet for drinking or food prep, those yes. are the ones that are tested. Yes. And all of those that are food prep or, or drinking are tested. In those are the ones, so if, if okay. they use two, you know, in family child care homes, sometimes that's only the kitchen yeah. sink because the bathroom sink is used for toilet. Um, in centers, you, you generally will find um, at least one uh, faucet in every classroom, preferably, that can be allowed for drinking water. Um, so all of those would have been tested if they're used for drinking water. Oh, but if you were to go into a program that had four little bathroom, four little sinks in the bathroom, because they're bathroom sinks, we would not have tested them because another regulation prohibits children from drinking out of those same places. So um, the, the 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 test that you've done is it all first draw? I mean, what? Yes. What are the differences? Uh, we do first draw unless more than 15 is detected and then they do have to do a second draw and then we make decisions on remediation. So is first draw, is that supposed to be sitting overnight or a certain amount of time or is it just sort of when you get to it? It's been sitting in the building overnight or at least six hours without being used. That's okay. the first draw. So it's, it's first draw but it's not the 250 <coughs> milliliters, I guess. Uh, hang on, I'm looking at the guidance yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, what does it say? It's a, diff it's a different system, but it does give an indication of lead in the water. Right, and, but you can see right here, this is, our, this is from our guidance manual. So we, have, we publish guidance manuals that help providers understand fully the rules. So this sort of walks through the details of what the first draw sample. But of course, there's also, they get a testing kit, and they follow the directions of the testing kit, and they send it. Questions? You have and then we do, yeah. the, there's anybody, um, uh, so you can see here where it says they have to send a flush sample if their first draw exceeds the 0.15. And then um, at license renewal, we, we take a, a look again, which is every three years. If, they ha if they've ever had a high reading, we do that at the annual certifications as well. And we can sort of um, ramp up any of that monitoring piece without any significant change in regulation. We can just change our protocols. So is it approximately a third each year? Is that about how it works out, a third each year? Um, well, there are annual certifications. So yeah. though we have now moved to a three-year license, yeah. every year there are certain things they can send in. And we can't, right now, only if your water sample has, has failed, or do you have to redo it every year. Okay. So we recheck it. If you had one higher than, uh, than the, one, the 15 parts per billion, um, we can change that and say it's required every year for everyone, no matter what. You know, we can make it part of the annual, um, annual certification. So we do check certain things every year. And then every three years, you go through a, f a full license renewal. You have 486 home providers right, right now, and how many centers? Uh, we have about 950 or so, almost a thousand centers. Okay. Did you do you want to keep going? Well, that centers. No, that the, and the rest of this is just information for you to see what is cur in current rule. One of the oh, go ahead. Oh, no, good. One of the one of the questions that, that I am, am considering, um, given that you know all of this costs money, is there a way, or would you have any recommend recommendations on the fact that all these child care facilities are tested every three year, um, and we do have information about those who have had a test that was over five. Um, do you see a way that we could perhaps do a rolling retest on the new standards? And these are different standards, I know. We've talked a little yeah. bit, when yeah. the law first came out and we were discussing it, we talked a little bit about trying to do it as part of annual certification. So everybody's on sort of a schedule based on whenever they were initially licensed where we do annual certain information that we need every year. Um, we talked about doing it on that, which would get us through it in approximately 12 months, but sort of not all at once. We'd sort of run through the process. That would, I mean, if we go 
to their license renewals. For some people that just got renewed, that's three years. That feels like a long time. So if we try to do it as part of the annual uh, certification and we started whenever the law is passed, that would get us through it, not quite by next January, but it would get us through it in, a, in 12 months from the time we passed. Just to clarify, you're saying annual certification is only if you have had a failed Well, in test. the past, we've done that only if you've had elevated, but we could send out a memo saying um, everybody at annual certification is going to have to do this. So, so our next steps, depending on what you pass, will be to send out notification to providers about what we need them to do. Either immediately, you, everyone's going to have to do this and we have to get it done and we'll just sort of chase everybody down until it's done. Or this is going to be required at your an annual recertification and tell them where to find that date in the system so they know. And some might do it sooner, some might wait, and we'd be, you know, poking them at annual certification to make sure it was done. But it would be a little, I mean, for us, it would be a little bit more in our regular workflow instead of like all at once. We could do it either way. So, Reva, if, if my concern is um, the EPA has 15 parts per billion, um, you support five. At three, what happens to the 486 home center, uh, home care, home care? Would they, are we going to be closing some of these people down perhaps? Losing oh, some no, of the I don't see us closing anyone down. Um, they would have to do immediate remediation. You know, if we found, uh, if we, if you moved to three, we just wouldn't have, they wouldn't, they, I don't know what, we'd have to talk to David about what to do about the water. Like right now, um, the remediation is you have to use only bottled water until you finish remediating. You can, and we've had folks do that, not so much for lead, but for other toxins. We've had people have to use only bottled water until everything gets completely cleared. Which is, we discussed, is five parts per billion. Right, which right. is the five parts right. per billion. So at three parts, you wouldn't be able to use bottled water. That was a bit, that's a bit of a worry for What us. do we do? I'm, and I'm only talking about the home care simply because is there a it becomes like unaffordable for them to lead. do these remediations. So I probably have to tell them they can't operate till the re remediation is done. That creates a big problem. Huge problem. That was a concern of ours at three. Thank you. Other questions? Now we have more. <laughs> so, okay. um, the estimates to get a new water treatment system in, I'm just going back to your testimony. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know if some of that data was below. One of the links was broken, and I just wanted oh, to. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, 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 it's fine. I just wanted to make sure I was seeing that data. Uh, if, if you had some, because you were, you were, and I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble finding it now, but, it's a, I, I, oh yeah, it's a 20 to $150 with an annual, op, let's see, the, the treatment system, so that was to operate the treatment system, and so when you say a few hundred dollars to purchase the treatment system, what are we talking about? Um, I would really have to call somebody in from health, because we got the information from them, so we got this, when we talk to health about, but again, this is my understanding, and I am going to look to David and I'll phone in a friend if I, if um, in some cases, a faucet needs to be replaced. Mm -hmm. So that wouldn't be buying a whole new treatment system, that would be getting the faucet replaced, and we would certainly be supporting providers with the resources to get that done as it needs to get done. Um, a greater concern is if there's larger remediation that can done if the water can't be corrected, they would need a treatment system to make sure that it was being treated all of the time, it was safe. So um, that was so, that's sort of a worst case scenario, that there wasn't an option for remediation <coughs> outside of the treatment system that need, that had an annual operating cost. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say, sort of a little ray of sunshine in, in child care. Number one, centers have been tested 
for the whole 10 years I've been here. That was not new in the new regulations, though they were tested to the old standard and only did a flush sample if they were higher than 15 parts per billion. But they have been tested for a long time. The, the building stock is generally newer than you would find in, in schools. Um, and there's always the option, uh, it's not a great option, but we do, if um, folks have a water system that fails, we actually have worked on relocation before, right? So we have some experience with making decisions about relocating a center with problematic uh, toxins in the environment to a new location that is safer and better for kids without interruption of operation. We've done, that's pretty extreme, but we've done that. So there are, there will, we're hoping that no one needs extreme measures. We're really ready to work with them. Our goal would not be to close anyone, but in a family child, you know, if there was, if we couldn't remediate with bottled water in the interim, we would have to have interruptions of service while remediation was, was managed, which we do as quickly as possible. I believe that there's a waiver in the bill, isn't there, for bottled water? Thank you, yes. Yeah. Representative Connell. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, you said that um, if it if it um, is above 15 parts, then there is a flush sample. If somebody exceeds the 15 parts per billion in the first sample, then we do a flush sample to test where the problem is and to decide how to where the best remediations are. And they once that happens, they can't use those they can't use those that water until you know that's when they go to bottled water until we figure out what the problem is and remediate. So that's the current process. So from what I am gathering so far, centers and anything that's licensed is does have water testing happening. Mm -hmm. um, you have an action level of 15. Mm -hmm. If there's more than 15, um, then you do a flush sample. Mm -hmm. You do have data on what the actual scores were, not just not just pass. No. And pass. I believe we can get this on centers. You, you, as well. you can we get that as well. Uh, you can support five parts per billion as, as, as a test and there's a possibility that we might be able to work out something that's maybe not <laughs> testing all at once but testing, doing a rolling cycle. As part of an annual certification. As part of an annual, annual certification. Yeah. We do have a process of annual certifications we could, yeah. we and could fold it into that process. And annual certification is only if you failed in the past. In the past, it has been, but yeah. we could build a, a, a sort of more rigorous process into annual certifications now going forward. Who's been paying for the tests? Uh, for centers, they've always paid for their own because it was always part of a regulation. We didn't provide the kits to the centers for family child care homes, which were, um, this was a new regulation in 2016, and uh, we worked really closely with the Department of Health to ensure that we paid for all of their first tests. And they're just coming up to the second test testing cycles. Uh, they're just anybody who's and then new folks have been who weren't licensed, who weren't registered or licensed prior to 2016 have been paying it as part of their sort of startup costs for their business. Um, I will say, Let's Grow Kids has a program where they're helping with startups, so that may have been covered for them by someone else besides us. But I think the kit's only about twenty dollars or so. It's not a it's not a $250 test. It's fairly reasonable. So most people, if they're starting it up, they know they have to do it. They'll do it. Other questions? Okay, so then you, between you and health, will get information back to us on child care facilities. Yeah, we'll work on that, on the centers. Right. And what we can see if, is we did, went to five, it is likely that we'd pick up 14 out of 486. <coughs> and what I will tell you is a certain proportion yeah. of those uh, center-based programs are actually in schools. Yeah. So it actually will be kind of a relief if they're yeah. all held to the same standard because yeah. now it's been sort of tricky for the preschool programs <laughs> that are held to our standard have been an anomaly in their buildings. But yeah. um, so, so we'll have to look, we'll look specifically at those yeah. and make sure we're coordinating the you. overall school systems about not making them do stuff more than one time. Right. Yeah, yeah. we'll figure that out. We've been down that road before. Yeah, we'll figure that out. <laughs> Yeah, yes, we'll figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> Fingerprints. Okay. Um, Reba, how many uh, total are there again in the state? Uh, we have over, uh, we have about 1,200, a little bit north of 1,200 now, that we are 
starting to rebuild, so mm -hmm. that could have changed since the last time I dated. But I can get you that. I can send you that this and afternoon. Do you have any idea what percentage is newer housing stock? Uh, I don't offhand, but um, just in general, they tend to be in newer buildings often. One of the reasons our concern was about family child care homes is because they're in homes, they might not be. But most of the buildings that center-based programs are in, unless they're housed in schools, tend to be in slightly newer stock. And out of every 10, how many do you suppose are rented or leased? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. I don't even want to estimate because I, I'm not, I think a lot of them probably are okay. rented or leased as versus owned. Um, but that's, I can, I'm not sure if we have that data, but I'll check. I'm not sure if we asked that question. That's another layer of complication. <laughs> yes, because there'd be a landlord involved. Though I will tell you, in general, whenever we encounter, um, you know, we test for a lot of toxins, um, and generally landlords are, are, if they're if they're renting to a childcare program, they're generally very cooperative with us. We we rarely had problems with that. If we were to look at other um, health-related issues in our childcare centers. So one is lead. What else would you be concerned about? Well, I mean, we are we test for carbon monoxide, uh, and and I would have to. Um, I'd actually like to go. I, I almost brought Crystal with me. I, I'd like to go get Crystal, but uh, we feel we're testing for most of them. You, you might have recalled a couple of years back, um, they found some brown sites that were related to the clean date dry cleaning sites right, right. and so we worked really closely with health we did a full analysis of where any of those coincided with child care programs we retested all of those child care programs to make sure that none of those toxins were coming into the programs and um, we work pretty closely in partnership with health on anything that's that's coming up or that we hear of that might potentially be a danger to children um, I don't know that right now there's anything because our regulations are fairly new, uh, we we actually went to health, we went to ANR, we talked with them at the time that we were that we were doing the changes, asking for everything we needed to test for at that time, and we updated all our regulations around theirs. And I will say, uh, ANR is is a good partner in that one of the things we say to people who are interested in opening new places is deal with your water system first because the water system is often what holds people up at the end because they haven't gone through the process to make sure that it's safe. People assume that say it used to be a restaurant so I'm sure it's safe for children but the requirements around a restaurant where people come episodically to the requirements around a place where very young children and staff come every day are quite different. So people get tripped up by that. Um, and a &R, we just always say go to them first on your sites and make sure you're on a safe water system, make sure it can carry what you're estimating as your population here. Um, and we partner very closely with them on this because the water system is quite <coughs> critical, making sure that that's safe. We want kids to drink lots of water every day and we want that not to be poisoning them in any way. Well, given that 90% of lead um, poisoning comes from, you know, other than water, comes from soil, comes from paint, um, do you do anything and given how much children spend in dirt? <laughs> oh, yeah, we have an entire testing process around uh, around all of those things. So we have, they have, uh, I don't know if they're called EMP practices anymore. Uh, every provider, so I can actually send you the regulations around that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bunch of regulations specifically around lead in the environment. So, right. and there's stuff our staff looks for, um, mm -hmm. and then remediation that has to be done if we see anything like chipping paint or um, if there's anything detected in the soil. We do a lot of that testing already. That's helpful. Yeah, I'll send you that. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, just to note quickly to Let's Grow Kids, if you have anything you can send us on any help that you provide, you could provide to centers for uh, remediation toxins. We'll just get that from you at some point. If you could do it. Okay. Um, Nicole Mace. Allergy season. I brought pepper.
paper copies. Does anybody want paper copies? Do we have a letter? I, I sent it to yes. you. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. So. Shannon, that's not under today's date. Nicole's? Yeah. Association. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to testify on S40. Um, and I want to start by saying, um, of course, this is an important issue, and schools should be testing to make sure that there's water uh, that children are drinking in their schools is safe to drink. Um, so we support the intent of the legislation to ensure that children have access to safe drinking water in schools providing safe and healthy learning environments for all Vermont public school students is an important equity conversation and is an important and appropriate focus for policymakers and school leaders. Um, as you all know, because you've talked about this, um, this session, there's been no state support for improving school facilities for more than a decade. There I am. Um, this year, we have seen uh, increasing emphasis on hardening school facilities uh, to make sure uh, they are physically secure and on implementing state initiatives to ensure environmental safety. This new interest comes on the heels of several years of policy interventions and sharp rhetoric from Montpelier regarding high property tax rates and lowering the cost of K-12 education. Despite the fact that the state has expressed no support for updating school facilities in over a decade for delivered support, we now see a sense of urgency to test every school outlet in the state of Vermont and establish the lowest lead action level in the nation. This new sense of urgency has already raised alarm bells among parents and community members by suggesting that Vermont schools are somehow less safe for children than their own homes or other community facilities. Um, the results of the pilot report are useful and important and should provide us with um, insights into how to design a program that could, that could work in schools. Um, but to me, they do not raise this issue to the level of a crisis that needs to be addressed in the next six months. <coughs> S40 further fuels parental concerns, and we have had schools contacted by parents because of the media around this issue. Um, so the bill requires schools to send letters home to families indicating that lead testing is occurring and depending on the action level and results, stating that the water at school is not safe. This is despite the fact that there is no guarantee that the lead levels in the child's municipal water supply are any lower than what is found in her school, not to mention her own home. These letters are also required to describe how the school district will respond to actionable lead levels prior to the district, even knowing which outlets may have elevated levels and what measures will be required to remediate the situation. That's in the, in the language of the bill. As has been discussed in this room, S40 establishes the lowest action level for lead in the nation, even lower than the lead level allowed for bottled water. This places schools and child care providers in a very difficult position. It's not clear why Vermont schools and child centers would be held to this standard, other than, as we've heard, there's no safe level of lead. We understand that. It's also important to understand what can be achieved, uh, particularly in a short time frame and within limited resources. Other states that require lead testing of drinking water in schools have opted for action levels closer to the EPA standard. 
even less clear, and this is really, I think, the most important part from our perspective, is why an expectation is being created that this ambitious program will be fully implemented with actionable levels identified and treated across the state in a single school year. You've taken a lot of testimony this session so far about other state programs that have not been implemented very well because they have not been given adequate time or support. I participated in a two-hour phone call with school facilities managers on Monday. You heard from some of them yesterday. That conversation made clear to me, it prompted my request to testify that the cost estimates of S40 are too low and the impact on local budgets is unknown. We know that the lower the action level, the higher the remediation costs, and that remedi remediation may be as straightforward as is indicated in this report from the Department of Health. It may be straightforward in terms of replacing uh, fixtures or as complicated as replacing water pipes throughout the building. We do not know. S40 makes no clear commitment from the state with respect to reimbursement for remediation expenses. It merely states that a district will, quote, be eligible for assistance from the state for the cost of remediation that has been implemented or scheduled as a result of sampling conducted in the calendar year preceding January 1, 2020. So if you want to be eligible for some assistance, you have to have uh, conducted the sampling prior to this coming January. That is not a commitment to support school districts. You know, that's not a sufficient commitment. And it's not um, that the, the fiscal note attached to the bill, we believe, underestimates the total cost. So while the goal, I believe, is 50%, um, we're not clear that, that the amount that's been allocated or appropriated is sufficient to even cover 50%. We do know that districts have not budgeted for the local costs of lead testing or remediation in their FY20 budgets. Uh, you heard that from school facilities managers yesterday. Um, and it is not as simple as um, the state covering for the cost of the lab tests. There are t time and personnel involved, potentially training involved, potentially the need to um, seek outside assistance uh, for someone to, to uh, do the testing itself. Um, not to mention the remediation that will be required. And, um, you know, obviously, if a school identifies um, outlets that have lead levels that are above the action level, wherever that's set, it is incumbent on that school to take steps to remediate. That's not something they can say, we didn't budget for that this year. We'll need to wait until next year. Um, so again, what level of expectation are we creating in our communities about the capacity of school districts to respond um, when they receive uh, <coughs> test results? Um, the Senate and the administration are hoping to begin the, pro the program during this current school year. I think that there's a fair amount of um, pressure to pass this bill quickly. Uh, so that that testing can begin. We also know there are no local funds budgeted for testing in FY19 either. So we potentially have two consecutive school years where there are unanticipated costs. Um, and I'll say, uh, speaking of costs, I just want to alert you to some of the education funding dynamics that you may not be um, as tuned into as the Ways and Means Committee uh, is testified there yesterday, they've approved a yield bill that um, keeps property tax rates level, despite the fact that education spending increased by 4% this year, uses $24 million of one-time money in order to do that. It's the third consecutive year in a row that upwards of $20 million has been used to lower property tax rates artificially. Offsetting revenues this year, the one reason education spending went up 4% is because districts had less access to fewer offsetting revenues through reserves or grants or federal funds. Um, so increases in spending were actually only 3%, but because they had access 
access to fewer offsetting funds and spending increased by 4%. If districts are required to deficit spend in order to uh, respond to this lead testing program within the next six months, then that creates an even bigger hole for FY21. People just need to be aware of that. And, and, and potentially question why we're continuing to use substantial amounts of one-time money to buy down property taxes when we've also identified the need for environment to address and mitigate environmental hazards in schools. Perhaps that's a better use of one-time funds. I'm sorry, did you say that they actually have passed a yield? Yes, unanimously. <coughs> I did raise these concerns in the committee yesterday. Not to mention, I also raised uh, health care bargaining. It's happening. Uh, that is an, an equally ambitious uh, task. We're seeking to align the health care benefits of licensed employees and non-licensed employees. The price tag of that package is yet to be negotiated. Um, but that's another uh, unknown potential uh, liability on the very near horizon. So, uh, the VSBA strongly believes the state of Vermont should fully fund the cost of the mandatory lead testing program and ensure that there are adequate numbers of state employees on the ground, plumbers or otherwise, prepared to implement the program particularly if we're going to break new ground by establishing the lowest action level for lead in the nation for our schools and child care facilities. So S-40, as passed the Senate, appears to be unimplementable and underfunded. For those reasons, we do not support its passage. Do you have a response to if we move the level to five parts per billion feet, the same level as water, as bottled water? Again, I think that certainly makes more sense. Um, and um, we don't know the extent to which um, uh, that will, you know, what, what the costs of remediating to that le action level are. We've got a pilot with a small sample size of districts. Very, it's not clear to me how many were at five based on the, um, so one to, between one and 15. So, not many. There weren't many. Um, you know, again, it's important to do the work. I'm not sure why it's being framed as a crisis because it robs us of the time we need to put together a program that will work. Uh, to sort of approach it in a slower, more methodical, data driven way, there's some thought of. Let's just get the testing done, see where we're at, and um, come up with a remediation plan at that point. It seems to me that still brings up issues of a perceived uh, crisis or uh, heightened parental concern. Even though that process might sound more logical, I think you still have that issue to overcome. Uh, thoughts? Agreed. And I, I think there's another approach that could be to, based on the results of the pilot, identify the most at-risk facilities, whether it be the age of the, the facility. Um, I don't know exactly what the criteria are, but to triage and target, you know, and phase it in over. I think the original proposal from the administration was a three-year rollout of the program. While I understand that doesn't satisfy some interests, uh, it, that seems far more feasible to me um, and, and does not put schools in a position of um, uh, needing to respond to a crisis uh, in, a, in a time frame that really is, um, I don't know how they're <coughs> going to do that. Yeah, but would you agree, though, that just doing the testing and assuming that information would be public, which it certainly should be, that you could be creating 
you, you can say, well, with a three-year rollout of remediation, but there's going to be demand for immediate action. No, I don't think you can separate the testing from the remediation. I think it's a three-year rollout of targeting the schools that satisfy some criteria to be most at risk. Test, remediate, have another cohort. Test, remediate, have another cohort. Test, remediate. What's unacceptable is that there's been no interest or focus on school facilities for 12 years and now all of a sudden we need to fix this problem and we need to do it in six months and school officials are going to be left holding the bag with their communities and with their budgets and the parents so you're you're addressing just schools correct those we're are leaving, my members we're leaving out a whole different contingent of other testing here, which is approximately 1,400 centers and homes. <coughs> Children. <coughs> is, is, I wonder if there's any, been any concern from the public regarding that. I believe there are two positions in this bill to support a program that is as far reaching a program as I've seen with as short a time frame. And I believe that um, the administration has downplayed the operational and fiscal impacts of this, this scope of this program within S-40 and the timeline established in S-40. Representative Kahn? Uh, the Agency of Education, uh, just on that topic, has said this could work better, depending on whatever the rollout happens to be, but their feeling was at least at the time that they testified, we need a full-time person in our department to help the rollout of just the lead uh, uh, program because um, they're best equipped to sort of coordinate schools and co coordinate um, what needs to be done to address this. Um, well, we've seen how interagency responsibility and dual responsibility has worked on other programs, and the answer is not very well. So I think it's important that there is a lead. Equally important is that a program is designed with school officials at the table, including some of the facilities directors you heard from yesterday. So it's, it moves from theoretically this could work to practically how will it work. Questions. <coughs> tell me, tell me a little bit about how you would set action levels in a rollout. If you were to roll it out. So year year one, we just test. We have another fifteen, is what you're you're saying, correct? Year one, we just test. We've already got an action level of fifteen. Do that. Gather gather the data. And how would you how would you move forward from that? Well, I, I mean, so I'm not an expert on action levels. Other than I know the lower the action level, the higher the costs are going to be, and the more the more outlets we're going to be talking about. Um, um, and I I do think it's probably a good idea to keep the level consistent throughout the course of the program, so you're not sending missed messages to communities. Like last year, it was safe because it didn't cross the EPA threshold, now we're determining it's not safe because we've set this new action action level. I think it needs to be clear to everyone why the action level is being established, where it's at, and what steps are going to be taken to make sure we can support schools in getting there. Also being clear that this is an ambitious level. It's lower than what's required of municipal systems. It's lower than what's required in most other states that require testing in schools, so that we're not creating this false narrative out there that Vermont schools are not safe spaces for children. Uniquely unsafe. So I'm trying to get some of the, the practicality of this. Yep. So we test, and then do we direct the Department of Health to set the action level moving forward? I don't know that that's a useful step. I think to me the better step is to identify the action level um, and um, prioritize facilities that need to be tested short term, mid term, you know, year one, year two, year three, hold everybody to the same standard. I don't think 
um, I, I'm not seeing it as a, as a phased approach where you, you do one round of testing just to see where we're at. Because to Representative Conlon's point, I think once you've done the test, you need to move into remediation fairly quickly. So you would see then perhaps setting a different timeline for remediation based on how high your level was? No, I would see the remediation needs to, you need to decide on the action level, which in my view should not be lower than five, because I don't know how you implement or enforce that. Um, you would support a level of five? I would support uh, a program that has funding, timing, and um, at a level that's commensurate with the decision that's made around an action level. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I'm just a little confused because, I, first of all, I feel like the committee is grappling with this. I know. And you I know, we haven't really, that. you know, every day we come out like with more questions and we really, I think, <coughs> trying to seek understanding and make a reasonable, cost effective, safe decision. But that's why I kept asking the Department of Health um, for an action level because I feel like this is a health issue. Mm -hmm. You know, and they you came back with five, right? So I feel like I feel like they're the experts, and why would we not why would we not go with five if that's the recommendation from the, you know the health experts? Because this is a health issue. Um, if that's fine, if that's the approach that gets taken, my my concern is, and how are we funding this program? Right. And how are we rolling it out in a way, I mean, you, you were all embroiled in Act 46 conversations just a month ago. Are we going to expect districts that are contending with forming a new system and, you know, I mean, how much are we going to ask these folks to respond to within the next six months? What are the trade-offs? And is it the possibility that the program will fail because the timelines are too ambitious and the level of support from the state is inadequate? Do you have a recommendation on the timeline? I, my recommendation is that you take a phased in approach and you, and you have a certain number of districts move in year one, two, three. And that we refrain from um, uh, uh, public discussion around this that creates a greater sense of urgency than perhaps is warranted. How do we do that? <laughs> Nicole, do you uh, think we should test child care centers as well? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and I'm sorry for the sort of hey approach, but it's um, we understand. It's it's difficult to um, f feel like a program of this um, nature is being put together without um, due regard to the concerns that are being expressed by school officials. So thank you. For the we are definitely trying to figure out. How I to, understand, how to I, and I appreciate this it. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <coughs> uh, Ted, I have you. And then we'll take a brief break. Okay. Come back and discuss. Ted Fisher, Vermont Agency of Education. Um, just really quickly to preface my testimony, we um, we tried when preparing this to, as much as possible, hew to the uh, the notes, the bullet points on the board about um, cost timeline and and uh, and so on. Um, but I think 
I just want to recognize sort of by way of preface that uh, that there are some significant policy decisions that you have to make um, before you vote on this that that influence all of those things so um, before I read my prepared statement, I just think you've uh, taken significant expert testimony on the benefits and drawbacks of various aspects of this bill, including action level, cost, logistical complexity. Um, and, and so based on your decisions, those will influence things like what the best and most workable timeline is, um, what the cost is, and, and these are tough decisions. <laughs> That's why you folks get paid the big bucks, you know. I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, um, you know, so, so a lot of that is going to be dependent on some of the decisions that you make. Um, and so we just want to offer um, the, the agency does not have ex technical expertise in a lot of these areas. So we really just want to offer some thoughts on the logistical complexity and, and financial stuff. And I have my my colleagues from DEC and VDH who I will wave to if, if I get into too deep waters. Um, so. Um, I just want to also note up front, and, and we'll go into my written testimony, that the, our understanding of the scope of this problem is to a certain extent incomplete. We don't fully know. I mean, you were hearing some testimony from, from the facilities managers yesterday about what some of the costs might be or the, the complexity, but it, you know, it's going to vary depending on the individual school district, um, and that's something that we're just going to have to, um, to that's going to just be part of this program. So. Um, so we're pleased to offer additional testimony, um, and, and the agency supports all initiatives to improve student health and learning. Um, and it's important, um, however, that we craft good public policy that balances state resource with good public health outcomes. And to that end, we're offering the following um, suggestions. Um, as, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, in terms of fiscal implications, S40 has significant fiscal implications for both the state and for school districts. And the decisions, um, such as the action level, the scope, the extent, and scope of testing, the timeline, um, the the decision on whether or not to include childcare facilities in this, these will all have fiscal impacts both on the state and on local entities. And then just to mention about the state versus impacts to local entities, it's important to keep in mind that all Vermonters will pay for the costs of testing and remediation, at least in the case of public schools. Um, because uh, what we don't fund directly up front in terms of uh, uh, paying for testing or remediation costs sharing is going to come back to us in the future years through the school budgets. And I just want to um, appreciate and echo what Nicole Mays mentioned earlier about the risks of deficit spending by schools in an environment where education spending is increasing. Um, so. Uh, there are multiple policy decisions here that could have fiscal impacts. The action level is mentioned. Um, if the General Assembly chooses a lower action level, it's likely the remediation costs will be higher. Um, you've taken expert testimony on the action level and the complexities of remediation, and you should weigh the increased costs against the improved poss the possibility of an improved public health outcome. Um, and just to mention uh, testing protocols, uh, the, the General Assembly should consider setting a testing protocol that's as clear, simple to comply with as possible in order, um, again, with reference to what you heard from yesterday, <coughs> the facilities managers to make sure that this is, this is something that is achievable and, and clear and easy to understand. Um, and uh, also, and with regard to the timeline, make sure as best as you can to, to set forth a, a feasible um, timeline that will be financially and logistically workable for districts and for the state. Um, and then finally, um, you should one other thing to consider that was mentioned a bit yesterday is um, to the extent uh, remediation, there could be flexibility in remediation. Some of the facilities managers mentioned, um, you know, instead of taking a tap fully offline, they work um, well to, uh, they work to allow that to be used for hand washing or make sure that if it's not specific or it's posted for non-drinking, uh, not, not as drinkable water or, or, or other measures of that nature. Um, what I should say is that the Agency of Education doesn't really have expertise on that, so our recommendation to you would be figure out what you want to do and then let the experts at VDH and DEC, uh, particularly the VDH, uh, do the rulemaking to, to safeguard, um, to make sure that the appropriate public health safeguards are there. Um, and so that just gets me to the logistical complexity aspect of this. Um, there's a lot 
um, a lot in, in this bill. Um, and it, given the implications, it's in, it, um, I mentioned in written testimony um, the implications for student health and safety, but I also think, based on what the call mentioned to you a moment ago, there's also an implication for just making sure the public has a clear understanding of, of what's being done. Um, it's important to make sure that we get this right um, in the first try. Um, and so I think you should look in, in, write it, in crafting your legislation, you should look to making sure that your policy directives are clear um, and based on the judgments of, about what you think the best process is going forward. Um, and then allow, um, empower the, 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 the executive branch to do some of the detailed work through rulemaking. Um, because they have the, the BDH has the technical expertise to run this program, as I think they ably demonstrated yesterday afternoon. I mean, they've been doing a lot of work already on this to get um, to get spun up and up to speed. So give them the guidelines and, and let them let them go at it. Um, and I think um, that will also empower uh, local providers to as much as possible work efficiently. And I'll just say on on behalf of my agency, we're going to do as as much as we physically can to make sure that. Um, we uh, that we assist both our state partners and our folks in the field um, in getting this done and making sure it's as clear and, and easy to work with. So, um, I just wanted to mention, as I mentioned at the top, um, there's some there's some ambiguity here about exactly what the scope of the problem is, and I think that complicates the debate to a little uh, uh, a little bit. Um, we have a good understanding of the public health imperatives, but we have less understanding about the fiscal impact of it. So I just urge you to take keep that in mind. You know, I, I, my assumption is just from being in the room and listening is that there is going to be unintended or unknown fiscal um, and logistical complexities here that that we that we haven't been able to fully estimate. So, um, I will leave leave it there and answer any questions that I can. What do you see as the role of the of the agency of education in this? You might have said it. I'm just not. So so as currently uh, written, um, we we're sort of in a consulting role with VDH uh, specifically <coughs> in terms of working with school districts. Um, we we talk a lot, you know, almost on a daily basis to school districts. So to the extent that we hear things that can be used to help um, inform the process, we'll, we'll be providing that. We're already working, I, sh I should mention, VH is already working, but we are already working with them on, on things like communications um, and coordinating with them. We'll be coordinating with them in the Health Op Operations Center. Um, and uh, But the other impact, and that's why we focused on the, the fiscal and um, logistical complexity is that we, you know, we do the work on the on the school finance side, do and that will be that will be something that you know you, you you can appropriate what you feel is right for this year, but the balance will be paid through school budgets out of the ed fund. Do you see a need for staffing at the agency of education? <laughs> so it's currently drafted the bill, um, and and sort of based. It's hard to tell exactly what you folks are going to do, but I'll chime in as I listen to the discussion. Um, but as currently drafted, the bill will not require additional a AOE positions or resources. Um, previously, uh, there had been conversation and speculation about how this project might be related to school facilities or construction work and might sort of the scope might expand a little bit as part of that conversation. And that um, led us to make previous testimony in the interest of bringing to your attention that AOE has no capacity or resources. Um, or, um, or excuse me, not resources, no capacity or expertise in the area of school facilities and construction currently. Um, so if you make changes to the legislation that gives us a more active uh, role, or if you expand the scope to more facilities review, um, or if you take it from more of a school construction legislation next year, that, that will be something that we'll come back to talk to you about. Thank you. Good question. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Why don't we take um, a brief break and come back and start a conversation about the different buckets that we need to be addressing. As we move forward, discussion. We're going to be looking at, I'm hoping that we have our 
two, yes. Part two. So we've got our three departments in here, our three, the, the Agency of Education, Department of Health, and Department of Environmental Conservation in the room, uh, which we really appreciate you being here. So um, we've heard a lot. We've talked about breaking it down to the different categories of decision making that we need to do. One has to do with cost, another has to do with who we're testing, another has to do with our timeline, another has to do with the action level that we're going to set, and then remediation priority. I think the first thing that I would like to talk about, are people okay with talking action level first? Yes. Does that feel like it's the one where we're the closest? Right. Okay. So if we scroll through the bill, um, um, and the right definitions. On the first page. This sets the action level at three parts. We've heard 15, 5, 3, and 1. Let me just put it bluntly. Who would go with 5? Who wants a different level? Okay. What's, what would you like? Um, <clears throat> what is your, what, what were you thinking? I think we should, s I would probably go with, I don't really know. I, I don't, I, I'm not focused on the action level. Oh, yeah. I just think I, I don't have a strong feeling about it. I, I, I would be fine with starting with 15, honestly, mm -hmm. right. given where we are right now. And I am uncomfortable with the duplicate, you know, duplicating a regulatory environment for our schools to comply with and for municipal water supplies. I, I, I have a problem with, uh, you know, if we did five, I would like us to do it by pointing at the federal FDA requirement for bottled water, mm -hmm. which is five. Mm -hmm. I would like us to point to another regulation rather than create one out of whole cloth. Uh, I don't think it's appropriate at this point in any, in any way. There has been some discussion about referring to it as the bottled water as opposed to calling it a number. Yeah, but and that's something that's already regulated by, by the FDA, and I just think we should look to existing regulatory frameworks rather than creating a new one. Okay. Well, I think I've made clear that I wish that we were going for one. Uh, but since the interested parties have relinquished their uh, commitment to that, I mean, five, the CLF is okay with five. Yes. Yeah. Bearing in mind, bearing in mind that once you start the remediation, we've seen that the remediation goes well below five. So we have three minutes at this point on uh, five, but actually referring to it as, as pointing to a, the FDA regulation on identifying that. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, I, I just say one more thing. I think we can get to zero or one. Yeah. I don't think setting an action level of one will get us there any faster than sticking with the F, F, uh, EPA. If I did think that, I would support it. But I have not heard any anything to really make me believe that's the case, given how long we're going to take. There's nothing precluding us from doing a year of testing and then setting an action level next year. That won't, I, I don't believe, set us backwards on, on the path um, to getting to zero, or as close to zero as we possibly can, getting to let out of schools. So, um, anyway. Okay. Five. Pointing it to the federal level, okay. Uh, I just want to say yeah. five pointing it to the Department of Health, the Vermont Department of Health. They don't have that. They don't have, it. They don't have that. They they're just they don't they can't point to anything that says that's our standard. They're saying they're approving this standard for us right now, but it's not in writing in anywhere. There is a standard in writing with the FDA in terms of bottled water. Right. But that's the standard we can point to. But I'll point it to you. Do you have a standard that we could point to? So we make the Department of Health advisory one part of the study. That's your advisory, right. That's, but, but you have you have accepted that an action level of five at this point. Yes. It is likely one of the ways that we are able to get to the lowest mm -hmm. possible level. We we Okay. This doesn't have any findings in it. <laughs> okay. We could do some findings. So um, thank you for being here. We're just starting to look at some of the buckets of questions that we have to answer. And at the moment, we're looking at um, five parts per billion, but instead of calling it that, pointing to the FDA, bottled water regulation, 
Michael. Okay. Um, you want to incorporate that rule? Or just incorporate the standard? The standard, I think. What we're trying to do is not... Um, what Representative Elder was saying, he liked the idea of pointing it to a regulation that's already um, in statute somewhere. Okay. Um, can I sit down? Please do. <laughs> Please do. So have you looked at that rule? I have not. Um, so it, it is pretty specific to bottled water um, and uh, I mean the action level concept is the same regardless if you cross-reference the <laughs> FDA or not. Um, so it, it applies to the manufacture, processing, or packaging of a <laughs> primary container's units of the same size. Um, there, there's a lot of detail about how you do sampling. Um, so, I, I mean, if you're just going to reference the action level, I think you could do that, but I think the rest of it is very, yeah. um, it's, it's very specific to bottled water. It has E. coli mm -hmm. testing requirements. It, it's arsenic testing requirements. It's, it's really not a one-to-one -one at all. Okay. Whatever the language is that gets us to five in a way that makes sense. Okay. We'll, can we leave that to Michael Green? Yeah. And okay. just to confirm, you're talking about the definition of action level. Currently it says means in the Senate pass bill, three parts per billion of lead. <clears throat> so are you envisioning just a reference there where it would say five parts per billion? It was some cross-reference to this standard. Could you do that within a definition? Well, it depends on if you want the standard to, to potentially, the action level to change depending on what the action level is in the federal rule. Okay. If you do, then it would be, I would say, the action level, um, or they don't, I don't know if they use action level here, but the, the level uh, the acceptable level for lead underneath this rule as amended from time to time. And that, as amended from time to time, brings in future um, future changes. I'm going to suggest we just leave it at five. Are people comfortable with leaving it at, just leaving it at, just finding it as five in the, in the bill? Yes. 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 Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to take that as a Straw vote to yes. <laughs> okay. okay. Can I just ask one question? Yeah. That's at a flush level or a non flush level? I or think we've got an indication that we're, it's going to get really complicated if okay. we start breaking that down. Is that other people's sense? There was a conversation at one point about leaving the first straw level higher than the flush level. Mm -hmm. And it's my memory that we've gotten some testimony that said that would work really well. <clears throat> and we've had others that it might complicate the, the picture. So okay. um, at the moment, it's for everything. If we need to change that, let, if, if you would like to change that, let's get back to that. And you, that can be a discussion that you can have outside of the room with the folks. Okay? So you guys would be prepared to, to talk with Sarita about that. Okay. The next area we've, we've talked about, and if we're looking at definitions, it uh, defines some of those. The um, who, who, who's testing. We had looked at different, we looked at it differently. We looked at child care centers, and we looked at schools, and we looked at elementary schools versus high schools. 
and we've kind of gotten the sense that the um, department wants to go into that area and hit that area, so starting to divide up school sounded like it did not sound like a good idea. So in terms of who, we have, child, we have the child care centers, child care facilities, and our schools. Right, so in the Senate, they didn't want to use the term school. They wanted to bring it up beyond the discrete uh, elementary school or, or high school and, and to a higher level of the governance structure for whatever the school was, school district, right. district, 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 so they included independent schools. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they were referring to buildings, right? Right. It's any building that there were children. Right. Um, where was that? I remember looking at that this morning. The definition of building? No, it, yeah. It's the definition of building. Is that what it is? Yeah, it's page one. <coughs> Okay. <laughs> um, just to clarify, that doesn't mean homes, like my home. <laughs> uh, no, it, later in the, the yeah. draft, it says under control by the school district or, or supervision. Okay. Are we good? Yeah. Does that include uh, in my district? We have like the it's called the Project Store. It's an, it's an alternative school for kids. I'm sorry. Uh, it's like an alternative school for um, it's, it's through Northwest Council Support Services. It's probably an independent school. Yeah, but they take a lot of um, taxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, hey, right, because it's one of the approved schools for your school funding formula. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it it would be an independent school. It would likely, I would say, it's likely. I don't know it. Yeah. It likely would fall under the independent school. So if it's part part of the school, if it's an outbuilding, it's part of the school where the rec facilities are. That could be included. Right, and, and it's again, it's your testing outlet, and and the the outlet is the drinking water fixture, so it has to be for drinking water, um, where there's currently or potentially used for consumption or cooking purposes. Where is that? That is in the, the definition of outlet on page two. Okay. Um, so that outbuilding, if it's only the garden hose for the baseball field, then that's not used for consumption. And the mop sink? The custodian The mop closet. sink in the, in the janitorial closet is not. Um, I mean, having been a janitor, I won't want to. <laughs> well, I'm worried, like, yeah. at our sports facility we have, um, called Pro and St. Albans, you know, you go into the locker room, there's, like, six in the men's, six in the women's, and there's, like, there's, like, probably, like, ten locker rooms in there. So that's a lot. I don't know if I would consider those all drinking fountains since they're right across from where the toilets are, like, in the same room. Is it just a sink, or is it a... Just a sink. Yeah. And the, the water fountains are on the outside of the lobby. So it would be a lot of testing on those fixtures. I don't think anybody would use that. I would hope it would be good for drinking water. But. Right. I, I mean, I, it, it's kind of not even totally just about drinking, though. I mean, I was noticing, it's not funny, but I was noticing in some data from Oregon that some of the worst sinks with the eye washing stations that, where they had readings of a thousand ppb and high <laughs> copper levels. So you're not going to drink that, but it's not a great situation, right? You know. Um, so I think it's hard because it's all water in the school, and it's all ultimately, in a lot of cases, being driven by infrastructure containing lead. You know? So it's sort of like, it, shouldn't we be getting it all out? And they can take that out of service. <laughs> yeah. Well, just an example of something you don't drink from that's still probably important to <clears throat> mediate. That's all. I can't imagine 
trying to drink out of an eye washing station. No, but you don't want kids in your eyes. So. A lot of Things a lot of things, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're okay with who we're testing at this point to answer that question. So it's still school districts, supervisory unions, independent schools, and child care providers. Right. Agreed? Everybody agreed on that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the scope of the testing. And timeline. We've heard that um, we've heard that the current timeline is going to be insufficient. I think we've heard, in terms of testing, I think we've heard twelve twenty for all. I look to to Department of Health. I'm sorry. So, okay. end of December is when you thought that you could have December, a December 31, 2020. December 2020 would be the timing. We've had some. And that's for your initial sampling? I also just want to note that the um, Department of Health and, and the Department of Environmental Conservation are putting together some things that we could draft related to, to rule so that we can move ourselves out of rulemaking and have, have, make sure that's, that's directed. And I think that they're, com they're communicating with you about that, about language related to language for rulemaking. I don't think they've communicated that language to me yet. Right, but that is coming. And move yourself out of rulemaking? I'm sorry, I, I did not phrase that well. So that we're not trying to put things that are better in rule into sure. statute. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Are you looking for discussion on this issue? Yeah, I, I do want to just say one thing that, that we've heard. Well, okay. We have timeline in terms of testing, and then we have timeline in terms of remediation. You want to talk about timeline in terms of testing or remediation? Well, I think my concern is more scope of testing mm -hmm. than it is timeline of testing. I continue to be concerned about testing everyone, having this information, but really not being able to do remediation uh, at all quickly, just to the boots on the ground and, and other factors. And again, creating a public concern that I feel might be um, a little overblown. So you know, it, what we, the, way we, the way it's written in the bill now, it, even if we were to extend it to 18 months over rather than six months, it still is testing everybody. It's still creating a database, which in theory sounds really good. Um, but in practice, I think it's going to create a, a somewhat strong urgency to remediate that either may not be necessary or, but fr or frankly, will be impossible to meet the urgency of remediation. Uh, well, the, and that's the, my concern. The first step in remediation, if you have an outlet that exceeds, is you prevent student staffs, et cetera, from, from accessing it for, for purposes of obtaining drinking water or cooking water for consumption. And if you have no other fixture that provides drinking water, then you also have to provide alternative sources of drinking water. And there's no timeline for, for that subsequent remediation of that fixture. So you could just take it out of service. So if you have, if you're a small school and we've got lots of them, and you've yeah. got one kitchen sink yeah. that you need to fill the pot out of, right? Then, you know, then you're going to need to have alternative sources of water, right? And I think that part of my concern is that we've said that remediation is you can't use that anymore, even though a simple remediation would be a 30 second flush, especially in a in a water supply that's controlled by adults who should be able to to do that. We haven't allowed for. Sure. 
education and simple remediation such well, as flushing. That, that's where I think the Department of Health and, and <clears throat> the agency come in in our rulemaking is whether or not that, because they do have that authority right now in the rulemaking to determine what is, what is the appropriate remediation. So, right, they have requirements for guidance for taking samples, um, and then they have uh, requirements for implementation of the lead mitigation plan or necessary response. I, I think in rulemaking, they, they potentially could say that if you have a exceedance in this level, and if you do a, a flush draw for a certain amount of time, then you can use that. I think that's, that's a possibility that's, that's available in rulemaking. That's, excuse me, that's available in rulemaking now, or? Yeah, it's it's yeah. there now. It's there. I mean, if they wanted to say that, that that's an acceptable form of remediation, I, th I think they have that, that authority. Yeah, just to riff on that, um, I was really struck by Mr. Kenny's um, submitted testimony about the flushing protocols. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just wanted to sort of underscore that we're also concerned about creating a panic and schools feeling like they can't remediate and there's nothing they can do, that it seems to me that a very important first step, you know, now with available funding would be to roll out a really extensive education and awareness program around things that districts could and should be doing for free, or maybe not for free, because I understand, I, I understood that the flushing protocol was a little complex, but you know, that you can institute a flushing protocol, you can stop cooking with hot water, you can disconnect taps that were installed before, blah, blah, blah. So it just seems to me that the, the logical first step to just kind of give everybody something they can do immediately should revolve around some of these low cost or no cost alternatives that really are effective, right? Which can be addressed through rulemaking. Through, you can establish remediation guidelines. Yes. Which would get to this concern that we're discussing? Sure. I, I'd, I'd like a little more assurance, so I'd like to hear from the Department of Health if those, if they consider those to be suitable. Short term. Remediation efforts. I don't have to be now, we, but if we get some time for them, I'd rather take advantage of having Ledge Council in the chair right now. But in the meantime, we just want to make sure that that the Department of Health is prepared to create remediation plans. We don't want to be, and, and we can talk about this in the draft, but I'll provide the chair moments from now. Um, we don't want to be in the business of looking at individual remediation plans and individual faucets. That will be potentially you know, thousands uh, that will provide guidance and that, and that will be coming upon schools, et cetera, to follow that guidance. Or I should say, for the guidance, it's by do we, do we have any assurance that people will follow these guidelines? Well, if not, they're in violation of the rule, which is, you know, that's the same thing as, as breaking the law. So you didn't follow these guidelines, there could be consequence because you're violating the rules. Terrible things happen. <clears throat> we could have lead jail, too. Yeah. Is that a comment? Uh, well, lead if, jail, lead, lead penalties. Lead penalties. <laughs> We just increase the penalty. Like because the bars increase the exposure to Well, so I guess my concern is whether the Department of Health agrees that guidelines that say flushing is sufficient in certain cases, is a re if you agree with that, that is acceptable or not. So you're asking me point blank, is, is flushing sufficient? I'm asking you if it is a likely possibility that guidelines that say flushing is sufficient is a strong likelihood. I, I, I'm not in position to say that it's a strong likelihood as a, as a permanent remediation measure, mostly because things like... I didn't, use the word, I didn't use the word permanent, just to be... Okay. So as a, as a temporary measure, as you're putting remedi permanent remediation plans, yes. as, as certainly we would be willing to have that discussion. The issue with flushing is that it is, it is that the per protocols are sometimes, because people are fallible mm -hmm. and plans can be even insufficient, mm -hmm. flushing would actually be 
um, that would actually be sufficiently protective would have to happen in some cases several times throughout the course of the day. Mm -hmm. So it's not simply a matter of, of you know, turning the taps on for six minutes, you know, at, at 7 a.m. But in fact, we've got it several times. And so you do have, so flushing is probably inevitably going to lead to higher incidence of exposure. And therefore, I, I would say the Department of Health would be skeptical of that as a as a method, but we would certainly assess it. Uh, Brian Redmond from the Department of Environmental Conservation. I, I would agree with everything that David just said. Um, flushing is a very effective measure um, during the pilot phase. We looked at it more as a uh, mitigation versus a remediation. Right. So it's just, it's just to get you through to the point where you can perhaps exactly. budget for an improved. And that would be a case, <coughs> for instance, where, like, for instance, I want to remind the committee that two th in the in the, you know, the 27 taps that were trying to be above 15 parts per billion, 17 of them were, were certainly take, were just immediately taken out of service. If you had a situation in which you couldn't take a tap out of service for whatever reason, yeah. because it was the way to get to you know to, to fill the, the pots for pasta, then then perhaps flushing would be a an interim method. To right, Representative James. And that was all I had intended. Just a, a way of getting something out there now you know, that folks can do <clears throat> so that it doesn't feel panic with no action. <clears throat> Your department will be working on that. Ms. Representative Elder? So, uh, if I'm understanding, if, if, if we had the five PPV rate, the high end um, that we've had for uh, an estimate for JFO in terms of what could eclipse that level would be 25% of all fixtures, that's kind of what we're running with in these numbers. Um, if you just removed all of those from service, under S40 as it currently stands, have you fulfilled your obligation as a school if you just remove all of them and say, we're not going to remediate any of them, we're removing those 25% of our taps, does S40 allow you to be done there if you don't intend to remediate them? I think you need to interpret S40 with the requirements for providing drinking water in a public building, and there are requirements of certain distance. Um, so you you would have to to look at whether or not you could take all of them out and still comply with the requirements for providing drinking water in a public building. And if you could, I think that that is an acceptable remediation. Okay. Can I ask a question? Um, so, not sure if health or, or NR addresses to either of you, if a school were to do that, would that be an acceptable endpoint? Uh, Brian Redman from Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, just exactly what Michael just said, there are, the plumbing code is going to dictate in terms of what is acceptable um, for the availability of, of water in the facility. But if, if they could keep the availability of drinking water in line with the plumbing code, it would, it would be um, a, a potential option for remediation. As we saw in the pilot, we saw a lot of seldom used fixtures being removed from service. As, as, the, as a remediation strategy. Okay. I'm just going to say my problem with that mm -hmm. is that um, seldom used correlates to high readings, right. mm -hmm. period, right? So we're just going to go and remove all our fixtures that are seldom used, and who knows if we're going to get a statewide round of testing funding again. And so then, you know, we will have removed just the fixtures that aren't used that much. And the fixtures that have identical lead contents are all just sitting there. I, I just, in some ways I like that answer because it's like, well, at least it's achievable. On the other hand, I'm not sure we need $1.3 million of testing to get us there, which I know is what I've been saying from the beginning, but the, <laughs> I, I just kind of feel like if there's that kind of out within this, it, it just feels like we're, like this, this bill both has mandates in it, which have followed, um, I think, in good faith, lead to a very expensive solution that we haven't funded. And it also has holes in it that if you want to, you can just slip the whole problem through. And I, I just, 
uh, I just don't think this bill's ready. So I, I, I'm not going to make you hear a lot more of my take on this, but I'm, I'm not feeling like we're at a point of closure where this makes any more sense than it did on day one. Uh, following up on Caleb's concern, it brings me back to the definition of outlet. And it says, outlet means a drinking water fixture currently or potentially used for consumption or cooking purposes, including drinking fountain, ice machine, or a faucet. <laughs> I'm having trouble knowing if that's a broad definition or not a broad definition. Um, you know, is a, uh, a lab sink where you can fit a water bottle under the faucet in a science lab, is that a drinking water fixture currently or potentially used for consumption or cooking purposes? Uh, this kind of goes to Caleb's concern in a way because if you can narrow the definition of what we're talking about, uh, it, it sort of gives a little more guidance as to maybe you can just remediate without testing. Well, partly that's within your control of defining what the universe is going to be um, for testing either under the, the mandated entities doing testing or what they will test from. So if you want to say that it's not going to be a certain type of <coughs> or a certain type of sink, you, you have that ability to define that. Designated you could you could do that. So or is this one of those details that's better left in rulemaking? I think so. That's the question. Mm -hmm. Beth, this is going to explode if I don't. <laughs> right, Mom? No, I'm not going to explode. But I will tell you that we started a conversation with the Conservation Law Foundation late yesterday afternoon. I sent out emails to Brian and David. And um, I'm just going to suggest that I think we're at a place where we may make some progress in being able to deliver a consensus or close to consensus based draft. So we will hopefully deliver something to you that will bring agreement to as many of the points we can with areas of disagreement being fairly limited. That's the goal. I can't say that we will get there, but I can say that we've started the conversation and I thought the <coughs> intent was to meet after the testimony to work on that to see what we can agree to. Um, what you want to do with that information, that's your choice. Yep. But I can tell you that we've begun a discussion and um, I'm hoping we can get to a place of agreement where there's disagreement that'll narrow your world at least somewhat. Okay, good. I know that um, I've been in conversation with David and I do know that that work is going on. Um, Representative Hooper? Beth, how many hours and minutes close are you to that consensus? <laughs> hours and minutes? I don't. I think we're going to know in probably the first hour of discussion how close we are and whether we can get there or whether everybody can, we can move in a direction. There are going to be some areas, I think, maybe where we can't, but at least then we can come here to say this is what we do agree with and this is what you're going to have to resolve. Um, these are the points of disagreement. Okay. I, want, I want to keep us back and focused on speaking with our, our ledge council and how we're moving forward. I, I'm going to just mention one thing. <coughs> um, one of the things that has come up in terms of our child care facilities is that they're already tested um, at licensure, which is every three years. There also are some that are on um, um, yearly, uh, an, annual annual testing if they exceeded, I guess, the 15. And of course, they're not using the same level. But there's some question that's come forward um, in terms of rolling them into this program as opposed to starting all over with all of them at the same time, but rolling it in to, um, you know, addressing, addressing those those ones that we already know were over, actually they even know which ones are over five at this point, but rolling in the testing to, to align with um, their licensure as opposed to tying them into this so quickly. You can do that. You, you, you know, the, um, 
the initial sampling is by a certain date. Mm -hmm. uh, you're now talking about 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, so you could say uh, at their the first renewal mm -hmm. or their first application or first renewal, they shall test according to the requirements of this, um, but no later than. Mm -hmm. And you could probably put that out three years so that you hit everybody. Yeah. You hit everyone. Does that make sense? Yes. 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 What is that a quick one? I have a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Include in this bill that the entire program be paid for by the state and ask the state agency to come up with a plan by two o'clock this afternoon how it's going to work. Can I just keep it, just hold that one. <laughs> In terms of the child care facilities, <coughs> are we okay with changing the language to put it at the point of licensure? Yeah. In the way that you just expressed sure. it. Yeah. So <coughs> can we add that? Sure. Yeah. Just, uh, uh, is there was a licensure or certification? If there's like an annual certification. That's if you had. If you had a problem. If you had a problem, you had an annual certification. Okay. So okay. it could be at, at annual certification if, if required. So it's not here, but but we can connect you with right. with Riva. So with that kind of construct, you might want to move um, the child care facilities out to a separate section, mm -hmm. and street schools is one section, and child care facilities is separate. And you would also probably want to direct AHS to amend their rules to be consistent with, with the statute and the, the testing requirements. You might also want them to test the continued sampling to just be on the three-year period or an annual period if there's an exceedance. Mm -hmm. so you're, you're really not changing much for the, them. Yeah. It's just you let them hit the five under the, their, mm -hmm. their traditional life system cycle, you tell the department to revise their rule to be consistent with the five. Um, and I, I think you probably hit everything for the child care facilities. Um, unless you want to specify that they have a, a mitigation plan that is consistent with the mitigation plan for a school. Yeah, they do have a mitigation plan, I believe, in, in, in theirs. Yep. This would be important to... to right. So, but if the department's going to come up with rules about yeah. what the guidance is for a mitigation plan, do you want that child care facility to comply with that? Um, I would assume yes. It, it gets a little tricky because pre-K is under child care, it's also under education, so. Um. Okay, well, um, it sounds like you're probably going to be doing markup from something you haven't even seen. Um. Yeah. And we know that there's more coming in from there. I just, were you going to say something? No, no. okay. Uh, I assume our time with you is limited. Yep, one minute. Uh, okay, <laughs> uh, so there's, uh, no, there's some notification provisions in this bill. Uh, do you know, and uh, I'm sorry I didn't ask the expert before, uh, do child care centers have to follow what's already in this bill in terms of um, notifying all staff, parents, or guardians of students directly in writing or an electronic means of the scheduled sampling, the requirements for testing, why testing's being done, and how they're going to respond. Do you know if that currently exists for child care centers? I may have a quick um, answer. I think we already have the answer, which is no. I don't see it. There aren't that many references to the, the testing for drinking water for lead in the rules, and I don't see it in the three major references. It's 
really the information included in the application to the agency, not into to the parents or guardians or staff. Okay, so that's it for you. <laughs> okay. For now, are we comfortable with what Les Council is looking to draft? I'm not comfortable with the timeline. Uh, I don't know that we're quite done with the timeline. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the 18 months of testing. Are we doing 18 months? At the moment, at the moment, we're looking at testing is done by well, it's 12 20. As opposed to yeah, that, oh 1220 12, 20, 12, 20, December yes. okay. 2020. Okay, I, I thought yeah. it was sooner. Sorry. Yeah, it, well, it is sooner according to this, but we've given okay. it another year. Should, okay. should I begin drafting, considering that you're going to be working um, off of that? I I, I know that you, that you are working on on some drafted some changes, correct? <laughs> I, I'd say. Hold the, the thoughts. I don't think you have to, you know, we don't have to do sure. 18 versions of this. That'd be uh, preferable. Yes, well, I, w I would like very much to take that into account. So these are the things that we can eventually be throwing into a draft sure. that will be more inclusive of, than just little niggly things here and there. Thank you. Yes. Have we tried to figure out how we are going to not have a panicked population. That, Moms, that is a, a very good discussion. Um, I think we can let our lunch council go. Well, I you have some great ideas on. Yeah. Okay. You know, what I was thinking was yeah. to have the, the schools, the the child care centers, yeah. they should have to adapt yes. to all of the rest of the restrictions to me. <clears throat> and somehow we have to get some information out there to let the parents know what the heck we're doing and why we're doing it before they all of a sudden have heart attacks over this. Right. Okay. Media account. Yeah. Madam Chair, so yeah. for the record, this is David Amlinger. Um So the Department of Health does public communications on these issues, on issues, in fact, significantly more dire. I mean, uh, right. where there is acute and death, you know, coming um, in the near term. Uh, so the Department of Health is will uh, has, has developed communications for parents and schools to avoid avoid panic. So that kind of information can be sent to schools via schools, but but using materials developed by the Department of Health. Can I just take a moment? So my yeah. my intention, I just want to be clear and consistent, make sure I'm consistent with the interests of the committee and the chair, is that we, we are going to sit, the stakeholders are going to sit down following the, the, the the end of, of, of the committee discussion, yes. and we're going to try and come up with a draft that is consensus as much as large as right. we can, come to it as many points as we can. And then, I guess my intention, to be fair, is to say, you know, here's something that, that Beth wants, mm -hmm. you know, here's something that the CLF wants, here's something that the A&R wants, and, but there isn't consensus. So here's where there's consensus and here mm -hmm. there's, there's not. Is that a fair That's, way to proceed? That would be very helpful. Okay. Uh, you listed a few members there. I assume the public schools will also be represented. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and anybody who wants to be at the table can be at the table. You got a, a hand up over here on the left. Uh, Representative Jeff, Jeffrey. <laughs> uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, no, I, that's, uh, you know, I don't mind being called some things, but that's one I would prefer not to be called. Uh, um, that's an insult to us. No, no, I just no, appreciate sorry. the tight positions that you're always in, and I don't like conflict. The, um, I, I think it is appropriate to discuss the funding, um, because if, for example, you were to start with the premise that the state would pay for this entire program, like the public schools have asked you to do, then it sort of ratchets up the serious involvement by the state in terms of all the elements of the program to get them to work in the most um, in the best way. It's it's one thing to um, to be participating in these conversations and not bear full fiscal responsibility. It's another thing entirely to expect that the financial obligations for this program 
will fall to where I believe the right place is, and that's the state of Vermont. So it has a tendency to sharpen the lens and focus in which programs are designed. And I think even if you don't end up at that place, it's a fair place to start. I think in terms of our buckets that we're looking at, uh, we're sort of doing well on the timeline for uh, testing, we're good on the cost for testing, we're good on an action level. The next step is really talking about what happens in terms of remediation. Who's responsible, where's the unfunded mandate, um, and what is the timeline for remediation given that we heard the other day that we have a limited number of plumbers. Right, and if I may, Jeff Francis from the yeah. Superintendent Association, um, S40 as a passed the Senate contemplates rulemaking around um, future testing sequences. Mm -hmm. When you consider the million dollars plus that are involved in the first testing sequence, any interval at which you require subsequent testing sequences are also going to come with the same or greater cost. So it's a matter of not only the first one million dollars plus, it's a matter of every subsequent million dollars plus. Isn't that in rulemaking? That is in rulemaking, yeah. but what I'm saying is, even if you complete the package with the first round of testing and remediation, if the rules then determine that five years from now you'll test again, and I, I would say, and we are in communications with the Conservation Law Foundation, their first proposal was that schools get tested every year. Um, so for every subsequent round of testing, if it's going to be comprehensive, like the first round, there's going to be, based on the fiscal note, $1 million plus per round of testing. Something to keep in mind. Representative Elder? I do think that's an important point as we think about equity, uh, because, you know, having had a very narrow budget passage in our district. I'm just thinking that if certain schools had a larger obligation for remediation, we'd want them to undertake that, but that's dependent on voters authorizing that budget, right? And so I think looking at something that would that would come from the state, um, from a specific appropriation would be appropriate to make sure that this work happens uh, equally across our state and doesn't just leave it up ultimately to local voters to ensure that equity piece. There's conversation about where that money comes from. That money can come partially from the general fund. There's been conversation about taking it off the top of the Ed Fund. There's been conversation about um, working out something with um, the capital bill. All of those have been uh, are under discussion as potential uh, sources of support. At the moment, the current bill uh, with the money that's in the Budget Adjustment Act that came back from the Senate, currently has $860,000 uh, available for half of the mitigation, uh, of the remediation plans. Uh, I think we're getting information that that's probably an un <coughs> underestimate. I, uh, do we, that's the issue I have. Yeah. We don't know what this is going to cost. So our next step may no be idea. to get an updated fiscal note. I don't think they understand either the complexity of what we could be running into, in particular dealing with the home. So I don't, she can't imagine they can come up with a number without doing, I, it's almost like you need a home inspector to go in and say, this is what you need to do in every one of these facilities. Representative Bachelor, this is what I said yesterday. We're not going to know how much we need until we do the testing. We're putting the cart before the horse. So we need enough money to get started. Right. We need enough money for year one. Looking at that 24 million and the one time funds to buy down the tax rate. Yes. <laughs> But it's for the children. Okay, yeah, Beth. Well, just on the funding piece, <clears throat> I agree with Jeff, and at least I think as of last night, the Conservation Law Foundation agrees this should be funded, that we need to 
make sure that it's funded. But you know, if it, if the obligations in staff <coughs> to fund it, how much you appropriate this year if it falls short of the mark, the obligation by law is still to the state. Right. You would you would see a budget adjustment. Right. Uh, you know. To, to correct for the underfunding if there is underfunding. And that would be the mechanics of making sure that you have money to pay for the legal obligation. So, um, you know, one of the things I will hope you add, and I have language on that I want to discuss, uh, sort of run by some folks, is the obligation in statute to the state. But that mechanically is how it works. How much you put to it this year, uh, you know, you make your best guess. And then next year there's a budget adjustment. And at the moment it just says 50 percent. 50 percent is left to the local district, which I'm sure my friend over here would refer to as an unfunded mandate. Uh, if your friend over here says, "Yeah, that it is," but it's a it's worse if you don't know how much what the total costs are going to be. So uh, Jeff Francis from the Superintendent Association, I I tried and was unsuccessful because we weren't afforded a lot of time in the Senate Education Committee to suggest that whatever liability the school district will have be capped at the original estimate. So if your estimate is at $1.5 million for our mediation and you want schools to bear 50% of that, then it, you know, if the result of the deliberations is that schools are going to be held accountable for $750,000, that would be, I think, a relatively reasonable outcome. But if the cost sort of $4 million, the school district's obligation shouldn't go to $2 million as a result of that. So but one of the things that is well established, in my view, from these conversations is that we're not really sure what we're going to get to. So if it comes in less than that, everybody's happy. If it comes in exceeding the estimate, then somebody needs to be prepared to pay for it. And I, as uh, Nicole Mace testified this morning, no money for remediation has been included in FY 2020 budgets, which cover the period July 1, 2019 to June 30, 2020. So even if a testing program induces school districts to respond immediately because they see places they want to, that they can remediate, that is going to be a currently off budget expense. <coughs> So there's 24 million in one-time funds in the tax bill? There is. In the yield bill. The yield bill. In the yield bill. Oh, you can handle rain on, too, if you have that money. Which you know where that's going. I don't think you'll see any of that. Not a penny. I think we've tried that before. Well, they, well, they, yeah, they bought it down. They're buying down the... But that still doesn't address the real issue of no one knows how many millions of dollars this could eventually cost and where who's paying. You can't go. I don't know. Got to moving forward. How do we handle it? We don't know what it's going to cost. Send it back. Serena, do you have an answer to that question? No, I have to, Can I ask a question to <coughs> the Department of Health? Yes. So it's like looking at the pilot results. It looks like. Why don't I? Why don't? Would you? Would you mind joining us? Yeah. Keep the AOE, the AOE right, right there as well. Yes. Good morning. Good evening. Good morning. <laughs> Brian, Brian, I think of you guys like as, a, as a team. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, and Martin. <laughs> Martin. I would be Martin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old enough to know. Yeah. I'm barely old enough. Okay. Um, okay, so we do have a question. For so me? I was reading the results from the pilot. It certainly calmed me down immensely to read those results because it looks like, I don't know, eight tenths of schools are, are below the action level we just came up with. Is that accurate to say? Somewhat accurate to say? Anyway, is there any way that we can ex extrapolate from that pilot what the cost could, worst case scenario, be? <coughs> It, 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 it obviously it's in, I, don't, I don't have anything useful to say 
but only <laughs> semi, semi, semi useful, I should say. That, that the, we've heard a lot of information about the cost. The, 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 the simple matter is that within the pilot, only one school spent more than $500, right. mm -hmm. and, which is not per, per tap. Per tap, that's different. Right. So, but how many schools needed, it looks like very schools need, very few schools needed remediation. Very few schools. Very few schools did. Right. And is there any way, again, to extrapolate that kind of analytically, that the chances of, is this is a good sample of Vermont schools, and it could be that it's a very small number of schools that will need remediation, or we can't do that from this pile? I think that that's what the fiscal note did do was use the pilot. Okay, so I'm con then I'm confused as to why we're concerned about. We're not sure that that's accurate. That you, sure. that you, oh, you, that's you say, can you do it? I think the concern is that no, actually, you can't. You can't. Okay. All that's they looked at was the do. cost of a fixture. Right. They looked at what is a fixture cost, right. and they did that. They did not account for the labor, and they did not account for remediation beyond that. So that's, that's why we are concerned about using that. I believe that was the Senate's goal, though, was to say that we will participate in helping to fund fixtures. And that was they kept it limited to that. And we're hearing from, from the uh, Superintendents Association that that sounds like an unfunded mandate. Go ahead. Well, we got you guys uh, right there. Um, uh, do you have a, I can't, I should look at the bill better. Uh, could you just talk about um, ongoing testing and, and what you feel the protocol should be? The protocol is for testing. So, on, so, there, so at the moment, <clears throat> the, the testing in schools is, is entirely voluntary. So there are schools that have said, have reached out to us and said, we know this is coming, so we're just going to go ahead and do it. Now. I mean, what's the law? If we're putting in a new law, if we're putting in a new law, Yes. What, what is the Department of Health or DEC's recommendation for ongoing testing, knowing that it costs over a yes. million dollars? Yes, it would be, be the, the rulemaking. The rulemaking is what we recommend. The rulemaking the language that, that's currently in the bill. So we would so we would take we would take the time to to, to, to consult with the stakeholders and, and our partners to say what, what makes sense, and then we go through the rulemaking process. No. So we have that. Good answer. I can I can contribute a little more, and actually, your commissioner of health um, had um, had presented this on the record previously. That uh, coming out of the pilot and some of the analysis we did in trying to sculpt a statewide approach, uh, the initial recommendation for retesting was set at a five-year period. But I would I would agree with uh, Mr. Engler that we would need to go back and consult with the group of stakeholders and evaluate now that we're in a different place um, what the appropriate frequency is. So you were not already out, you were not getting ready to do every year is the way some people have been afraid. Okay. And again, it goes to rules and then it goes to LCAR and you are be taking public testimony and yeah. yeah. So the opportunities. Okay. Our money. What do we need? What do we need? Didn't you make a suggestion? Oh, yes. Let's go back to you. Well, the state, I, it, yeah. it, sh it should definitely <clears throat> not go to the Ed Fund anywhere. State and the agency should be responsible for it. I mean, they're mandating we test, but then they should be taking responsibility of that. <coughs> and, and again, my concern is what do we do with private sector? What do we do with the private sector? Who's, you know, is there going to be a tangle there with so, paying as a state Reba and said, for these people? Reva said that they have emergency money that they can make available if there's a situation such as there's a, a child care facility that could close because of something like that that, that they need to have repaired. She was going to look into that, get back to us on that. I'd like to know how yeah. much that emergency money is. Yeah. Is it 500000 Is it Good question. $2 million? Is it, and where's it coming from? So I'm having trouble seeing how this works without a state commitment to fully fund everything out of the general fund. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, otherwise, we're going to get into, well, if we do this out of the Ed Fund, what about independent schools? And we can't fund independent schools out of the Ed Fund. And so if we're going to say this is a, a public health issue, I just, we're going to twist ourselves Finally. around and around and around if we don't just say mm, state. State's funding it. State's funding it, 100%. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would agree that that would help. Uh, really, really it creates some great focus <laughs> on what's the best program yeah. through rulemaking. The Senate, the Senate wanted the schools to pick it up. Well, you know, who, when the schools pick it up, you yeah. know where the bill goes to, right? Right, right. right. it goes well, to the I'm the, and I am yeah. certainly not in favor. Right. And I'm the least, one of the least sympathetic people to uh, public funding for independent schools. But if you, you know, if, if, if we're mandating that they test and they come back with a, a major issue, you could be putting a lot of those guys out of business. And uh, if we're going to say that that's a place where kids are and they need to have lead-free drinking water, then the state's going to have to pay for it. So we need a fiscal note for the whole thing. <clears throat> if you and can, we don't if know you what can it, what discover it what the whole thing is going to yeah. be. Could we put the could we, could we put the money for remediation that's in the Senate version of this bill kind of to the side pending our full test results <clears throat> because if we are going to do testing every five years instead of every year then the completion of the testing will be a more momentous this point is, it, you know and then we'll have as Rep. Bachelor's been saying we'll have a lot more information to properly uh, estimate the scope and the cost well I, I love being able to do that what do we do if in December, someone finds out they have a high lead level. We can't say, "Well, we'll get back to you in a year after we figure out how much everything's going to cost." <coughs> so and we have a problem in that yes, we, we need do. to be setting something aside now, and that'll so, give us a picture of what 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 it is going forward. Can't we just shut the faucet? <coughs> well, they they can do all the, all of those 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 things, but they're going to have it. That some won't cost anything, but I, I just can't see that they can wait a year to spend any money. So if their testing's done, that may, maybe it's just you need to have had your testing done prior to accessing the money. I understand that the, the total amount accessible won't be there. But if we have some money accessible for remediation and your testing's complete, then I agree there shouldn't be a, you shouldn't have to wait for every other school to be complete. Uh, especially if we're talking about a phased, right. phased in testing procedure. I, Totally agree with that. Might run out of money after the first region of the state, but we might not. Well, we had talked about the concept of a priority in remediation as well, yeah. prioritizing the, the ones that are farthest over first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, your point is very well taken, uh, Madam Chair. That, and it, we just we're gonna we keep going around in circles. Because there's no easy answer to saying, well, if we do all the testing and all the information is out there, we, it's going to be very hard to say, well, we can't do anything about it because there's no money available. And I don't know the solution to that, except to say maybe, uh, never mind, I don't have a solution to that. <laughs> I do think we're getting closer. Oh, I do. Yeah. Really, yeah, I do. I mean, there's no more information we can possibly get. So we do all the testing. Do we set a priority about who gets the money first? Yes. Yeah. Do we or do does that happen in rulemaking? I would yes. love to put it in rulemaking. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think we have to actually have to do that, don't we? We probably have to do that, don't we? Yes. Yeah. Because that's actually session law anyway. Right. Yeah. So we would have to we'd have to set those per session law in terms of priorities, in terms of funding. Any recommendations? <laughs> in terms of remediation for uh, prioritizing. Prioritizing for remediation. We could take a look and come back. I mean, 
generally speaking, I think it would follow something in line um, that the professor from Middlebury presented. Yeah. Um, highest levels and most actively used tabs would take priority for remediation. I like language. that language. <laughs> Can you just say that again? <laughs> uh, it's, it's contained in, uh, it's in Dr. Yeah. Costanza Robinson's okay. testimony, but it's uh, generally speaking, yeah. it would be the, the most often used fixtures and the highest levels would take, really, most used fixtures over the action level would take uh, remediation priority. Um. All right, and we eventually want to be able to get to everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In your opinion, is there enough money aside right now to do all the testing and place all the faucets? Based on what number? Based on whomever we have to do, all the schools, all the, the child, children centers, etc. I mean, there's. <coughs> I mean, based on based on the fiscal number, based on I'm, I, well, if we if we things set aside, I don't know where what number you're going to. Well, we've done some, right? So we'll take those out. So, so we have to replace a lot of the faucets. I don't know if, 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 if there's enough money budgeted to do that. I, I think Coop, that's the, what we're struggling with yeah. is that I mean, I, we don't know the answer to that question. We have a fiscal note that extrapolates from the study, but we've been told that that's perhaps it's not as accurate as it could be. <clears throat> okay, I think we do know that we've got you folks and some stakeholders ready to have a conversation. Yeah. I'm thinking, I think we've gotten pretty far yeah. today. Um, <clears throat> I want to see if we can work on something in terms of prioritizing limited dollars. Heard an awful lot of discussion right now about the number of pressures on the it, on the general fund. There's like a hundred million dollars worth of requests, and we haven't even added anything for the general fund. Um, so I think we'll take a break here. Let you folks see how far you can get with your group. Bring it back to us. And um, I don't, I think today is going to be a long day on the floor. Um, but I think we're making progress. So, I don't care, you think yeah. we'll, we'll come back <coughs> tomorrow, tomorrow, that you want to see the uh, presentation tomorrow? That would be really excellent if you could do that for tomorrow. And I'll get Michael O'Grady in here. And please, please share, every, you know, I, you've got an open line to Michael O'Grady sure. um, <laughs> on this. I always like to get myself out of the bad conduit position. Get the two people connected. Yes. Yes. Oh, we've got announcement. Oh, that's right. <laughs> John Chair, would you like the students to come in now or? Oh, students, sure. Okay. We have a few students. That would be. A we need them. Brand. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Make sure they bring them yeah. left. <laughs> thank you. Yes, they're carrying me around. Okay. Thank you very thank much you. for your hard work. You have something to say to us? So would you come and join us up in the witness chair? Yeah. <laughs> it's not a court of law, though. No, it's not. Actually, it didn't sound quite right. <laughs> so, hi. So, for the record, could you tell us your name and who you're with? My name is Chandra Caro. I'm from the Compass School in Westminster, Vermont. Um, I just wrote my essay out there that I submitted for the um, school choice contest. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think I'm going to read it. Yeah, please do. <laughs> okay. Um, over the past two years, school choice has become something I've really learned to value. Each year I try to make a list of the things I'm grateful for, and every year my list grows with my newfound gratitude and appreciation for life. This year, Compass School was at the top of my list. I lost myself in public school. I didn't see myself graduating. I could barely see making it past my sophomore year. 
but here I am in the second semester of my junior year, thriving. Since attending Compass School, I can sincerely say that I've grown as a person and as a learner in more ways than I could ever have imagined. I lasted one semester in my public high school. I remember walking down the halls and passing the posters telling me I mattered. But deep down, I think everyone who passed them knew we were just another body to be accounted for on the attendance sheets, just another person to be checked for a hall pass. Hundreds of people coexisting in the walls of that high school, and never had I felt more alone. Engulfed in my bleakness, I turned to the wrong crowd. The open arms I was searching for came to me, but instead of lifting me up, they drowned me. As week after week went by, I found my motivation dwindling. I often skipped school, and on the days I did attend, the teachers didn't know how to help me. I felt overwhelmed by the large class sizes and the clearly distant, overworked teachers. My grades went from honors quality to barely scraping by. No one seemed to care. After just a few months, the rate at which I was slipping reached a whole new level. Drug use became a part of my daily routine. I needed help, but I felt as though I had no one to turn to. I ended up having to leave school to go get help. I needed to come to terms with my issues and accept that I didn't have to struggle through all the hardships of life on my own. When I was discharged from rehab, I needed somewhere safe to go. I knew I couldn't go back to the same school. I needed a place that could meet both my emotional and academic needs. My parents heard about Compass School through a family friend whose daughter had attended there. I'll admit I was skeptical and scared, but Compass took me in with the welcoming arms that I needed since the beginning. What I desired most at the time was stability and an environment that I could count on. The community that Compass provided was just that. With great patience and undying support, they taught me confidence, not only in my work, but also in myself and my abilities. Over the course of my first year at Compass, I was able to discover not only who I am as a learner, but who I wanted to be as a person. Without the option of school choice, I don't know where I'd be today. Compass helped shape the person I am today, a person I'm proud to be, and I am eternally grateful for it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, nice. Questions? Is uh, Compass a residential, or is it uh, a day school, or is it both? day school. Day school. Of course, we want to know where you went to school. Beforehand. I went to Brattleboro. <laughs> That's right. Where are you from? Yeah. And, and through what form do you have school choice right now? Is it because your community is is a choice community? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Representative Austin. Oh, so, are you what grade are you in? I'm sorry, you might have said um, that. I'm in my junior year. Junior. So, are you writing a personal learning plan? Are you writing a somewhat? I mean, I'm just curious. Yeah, I know I have one, but I did it like when I first got there, and it's <laughs> kind of confusing for me. Do you have a sense of where you might head? You know, After what, high school? Yeah, what your interest? Um, I'm, I'm interested in like psychology. I want to mm -hmm. be like a social worker or a therapist oh. to help people like through struggling. Perfect. You need you're them. You're looking at colleges. Yeah, I've been looking at some. I've been having a hard time trying to figure out like where I want to go with like financial stuff and like, all that. But I, I think I might want to go to like uh, somewhere in Maine or something. Cool. Castle. <laughs> 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 might win the prize. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really glad to hear that it's working for you. Mm -hmm. It's a really beautiful essay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have somebody else? Yep. Hi, I'm Abigail Ham. I'm a senior at Linden Institute. Um, high school is supposed to be the best four years of our lives, or so they say. It's also among the most difficult. Before high school, I was homeschooled, and transitioning to high school was a really big deal to me. And it was made even more complicated because I needed to have a surgery in the first month of my freshman year. Fortunately, it was also made a little easier because of the school that I chose to attend. My time at LI has opened up a world of possibilities for both now and my future that I could not have foreseen. My decision to transition from homeschooling was based on a desire to study in areas my parents simply couldn't teach me, like art, music, and Chinese. I chose LI because I felt that I would be in a unique position to access a variety of opportunities and pursue all of my passions instead of being forced to choose just one. This proof would be true on a grander scale than I could have imagined. Within two years, my paintings would be displayed in town, I would be performing with Pit Band, and I would have the opportunity to travel abroad in China. The list of opportunities I've had at LI still blows my mind. I've studied four languages, as well as taking classes in studio art, painting, 
dance, welding, and band. I've also gotten to challenge myself with AP classes, earned college credit through Libby State College or Northern Vermont University now, I guess. Uh, run track, join cheerleading, perform with and producing choreography for the theater company, writing for the school newspaper, and competing with the Kurtaman team at events at Harvard and Yale. Almost every industry in the world is rapidly globalizing, and future employers of my graduating class will be looking for employees who approach real-world problems from a global perspective. In this arena, my classmates and I have an advantage. My sophomore year, I joined Eli's Kurtaman team and found myself studying Latin intensely after school almost every day with two equally motivated and motiva motivating companions, one from Vietnam and one from Germany. Forming close connections with peers like them not only exposed me to a broader understanding of world politics, religion, and curiosity, it also formed friendships that will last beyond high school, make us a globally connected and conscious people even before we graduate. For me, these have been the highlights of experiencing a unique school environment. Studying in a place that offers every student access to preparation for their future, whatever future they choose to pursue. A preparation that transformed my academic prospects and gave me the confidence and well-rounded skill set to apply to college. In the future, as options like J-Term and other diverse opportunities continue to catch on and expand, I hope that high schoolers are encouraged to pursue their diverse interests in environments that can provide multiple opportunities to advance, advance that learning in and out of the classroom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's That's very great. exciting. Very, very Questions? Oh, it's the first, you know that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, you, in some of the, your experiences, you included some things like welding. Were you able to do all of that at LI, or did you travel to St. Yes, Johnsbury I did for some? All of that at LI. Oh. Wow, interesting. Where will you go to college? Um, I'm not 100 percent sure yet. I'm still waiting to hear back from a couple of schools. Shameless oh. advertising. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Ideas for me, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm back to the Chinese. Why did you pick Chinese? Because I know it's extremely hard. It's, I, I actually didn't find it as hard as really? most people think it is. Definitely writing was harder than speaking. But um, I, I don't know, since I was little, um, I think I, I read a book about China when I was like three or four. Mm. And I just like got really interested in it, and I've just always. Um, China, a really fascinating place and culture. So. Yeah, and this is for everybody, all the students. Just you know how much we love you. If you, even if you do go to college away from Vermont, we would love you to come back to Vermont. You know, we really, you know, we're all getting older. I mean, I mean, I'm not speaking for everybody here, but <laughs> well, we hope we're just, but yes. we, but we can really would love our kids to come back. Here. So, just keep that in mind. Thank you. It's very exciting. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We have, I think, one more. Did, did you want to say anything? Were you going to say anything? No. No. You're just in the presence. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We always love you. All right, folks, we're going to take a break. I guess that's what? it. Okay. Thank you very much.